introduction okay okay yeah. sorry about the whole confusion everyone so uh, welcome to iibc asia pacific's webinar on impact of virtual and augmented reality on the future of corporate communication i'm saima sharif i serve on iibc apax board as director of professional development and i'm based in india we are glad to have with us today ben foman Ben runs Wrestler, a content creation company. He lives in Wellington, New Zealand. Since its inception over six years ago, Ben has grown Wrestler into one of New Zealand's most successful online video businesses, creating content for clients both nationally and internationally. With a strong focus on business growth through creativity, Ben is excited about the potential of virtual and augmented reality. from both a commercial and creative standpoint in addition to that then has also started one of new zealand's first commercial drone company and yes in his free time ben likes to go biking and is currently writing a feature film for kids wow in this webinar ben will be talking about the future of corporate communication with virtual and augmented reality exploring possible uses case studies of existing work and helping paint a picture of what the future would look like when we all have this technology at our fingertips ben has recently made the same presentation at fusion ibc apax regional conference held at singapore on popular demand we requested him to do this for a larger audience thank you so much ben for doing this again just a couple of points before i hand it over to ben uh you can ask your questions using the q and a which will pop up at the bottom of your screen any time during the webinar ben will answer these at the end of the presentation also we are recording this webinar and will mail you a link after the presentation thank you over to you ben are we ready now okay yeah i will just uh full screen this presentation to do, do, do. Yeah. and share with you one second and just fix that put that there <laughs> hopefully everyone can hear me um and yeah. and we'll be able to hear my computer all right here we go so Welcome everybody. Um today um I'm talking about VR and AR and the future of corporate uh, storytelling with this new technology which is very exciting. Um this is my first webinar I've ever done so uh, it's very exciting and hopefully uh, everything goes swimmingly and to plan. Um I'm going to talk a little bit about the basics of what virtual reality and augmented reality are. in case um none of you know what the heck I'm talking about uh now I'm going to go through a few case studies and that sort of thing um and then I'm just going to do some questions and answers after that and uh hopefully some of you guys will um have some questions about the industries that you're in and that for me is the most fun exploring the potential for what the stuff can do in people's businesses um so Title of my talk: da, 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 Corporate Storytelling with VR and AR. Um, so yeah, just again, what we're covering: basics of VR, some case studies, and uh, why you should use it, uh, how to use it, and then my five tips. Um, so before I get into that, a little bit of uh, information on Wrestler. Um, this is our studio in Wellington, um, in the CBD. We create uh, video and virtual reality. for um, all sorts of different clients throughout New Zealand and internationally so um all sorts from startups who make merino shoes to um banks and um government agencies uh we kind of do the whole um thing for clients from strategy right through uh to the creative and then the production of uh, whatever experiences or videos we're making and then uh, distribution as well and uh, so start to finish we kind of see ourselves as um a little bit of a a hybrid agency in terms of uh, a traditional advertising agency meeting a um future focused um production company which means that we're really efficient 
and agile and all that sort of thing, which is great. So some of the VR projects that we've worked on uh, last year, um, one of them was for the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra. We created a, um, a VR experience in which you could be within the orchestra, and we've got a video talking about that coming up. Um, and yeah, you can hear in full 360 and experience what it's like to, to be within that um, orchestra, which is pretty amazing. Uh, another one for Allbirds, who are a merino shoe um, out of, uh, who are based out of America now, but use um, New Zealand Merino, it's a New Zealand CEO. Um, and we told their whole story of their product chain from the merino in New Zealand to the um, the factory, the, the mill in Milan, where the wool is milled, then to the factory in Busan in South Korea, where the shoe is put together, and then uh, San Francisco, where their headquarters are. So telling that whole product chain um, in, a, in a 360 uh, video, which was really cool. Um, then we made a uh, experience for Mercedes. They had a new car released uh, here in New Zealand, but it hadn't actually been built yet so we made a, um, a virtual version of that which people could explore and, and look around in one-to-one um, -one scale and open the doors and lift the tray and all that sort of thing. Um, we're also involved in a local um, initiative here in Wellington called Miramar Creative which is uh, Miramar's where Peter Jackson has his studio and Weta and all that are. And we're working to create an education um, platform for people to come and upskill in the VR industry and how to um, create this content and that sort of thing, uh, which is really cool. And then we've got um, our own projects we're working on as well. The coolest one is called Wake, uh, and it's about uh, empowering your inner feminine through dancing with goddesses. Um, and that got some funding from the New Zealand Film Commission to develop. It's like a interactive dance um, experience. Um, yeah, we, you dance with a goddess. Um, it's very cool. So getting into the good stuff, corporate storytelling with VR and AR. So the basics, um, there's effectively five types of virtual reality. When people talk about virtual reality, um, the first of which is called 360. And this is the most uh, similar to conventional video in terms of um, it, uh, it uses pretty standard cameras and it simply shoots everything from a whole bunch of angles. So uh, what you've got is um, a, uh, a camera with effectively the, the good ones would have six lenses on it and you're capturing every angle in, in 360 degrees. And then you as the viewer are put in the middle of, um, of those cameras and you can see what they saw. And so uh, this is very, like, it's not very interactive. It doesn't have any, um, any way of, of moving around within that 360 environment. You're simply, um, wherever the camera was, that's where you are as the viewer. Uh, this means that you can get really dizzy really easily. Um, and yeah, you know, as soon as the camera moves, it's quite disorientating. The next step from that, which makes it uh, slightly more, uh, gives a bit more depth is stereo 360. And this is kind of like where you've got what's called parallax. And without you guys being able to see me, it's quite hard to explain what that is, but it's effectively, depth perception. So if you, you know, put your head um, from left to right and there's something in, if you've got a, a foreground, a middle ground and a background, as you move your head, those um, distances will move in relation to each other and give you, you know, depth perception. Um, so Stereo 360 gives you that, but again, you're still limited to being within um, exactly where that camera was placed and you can't move around within that environment. Virtual reality is where you've got what's called six degrees of freedom, where you can move up, down, left and right, and uh, move around within a fully 3D volumetric environment. So uh, you can, you know, you can walk, you can look behind a desk or whatever. Um, and normally, these environments are made uh, completely CG, uh, and they are. Um, a combination of um, 
all sorts of different assets really that are built um, are built through yeah, can, um, through CG, but also a combination of what's called photogrammetry. And I don't want to get too into the technical stuff because it is very technical, but um, effectively these are the types of uh, worlds that will change the way um, people, you know, gain and uh, experience things like second life and, and that sort of thing where you're completely in, immersed in a new world that you can explore and interact with. The step beyond that is augmented reality. Augmented reality is where you've got the world that you can see around you, um, but then you've got digital objects projected over top of that world. So a great example is Pokemon Go. Um, Pokemon Go the you know the pokemon themselves were simply projected onto your world using like geolocation um, but they didn't actually interact with the world mixed reality is where those digital assets actually interact with the world around you using artificial intelligence so say the pokemon uh, could see that there was a desk and a chair and then it hopped onto the chair and then onto the desk um, and it, it could it could see and interact with the world around you. That's where the real future lies. And that's where um, companies like Magic Leap, who's a company which has a small base here in um, Wellington, but is mostly over in Florida. Um, they've raised $2 billion to create um, mixed reality headsets, which will in the future look like, um, you know, normal glasses, hopefully. Um, and we'll be able to project all of these um, all of these digital assets into your world that will be integrated with uh, everything around you. And the, the, the goal is that it will be so seamless that you won't actually know if these digital assets are in the real world or not. And that sounds kind of scary, but um, well, I guess it is kind of scary. There's no way of getting around it. You're just going to have to get used to it, I guess. Okay, so some case studies. Um, the first one is New Zealand Symphony Orchestra, and I'm just going to play this video, and it will give you a nice break from my monotonous voice. The NZSO were keen to do a VR experience to encourage new audiences to come and hear and see the orchestra. I was so stoked that New Zealand Symphony Orchestra wanted to experiment in VR. To be able to walk around the stage where 80 musicians play around you is just breathtaking. Having never used a 360 camera and audio together in the ends of it, so it was great to be able to have that facility to have that completely circular experience of the orchestra. To be able to have a viewpoint and an audio listening point from the inside of an orchestra, I mean, not many people get a chance to do that, so that would be really exciting. The rig we were using to capture this was the Omni, and it's made up of six GoPros that all shoot simultaneously. And through some software, we can stitch all those six shots together and create a piece of footage mapped to a sphere. We also had to kind of line up where the stitch lines would go off into the distance. And so we tried to position different portions of the orchestra to fall in between those stitch lines so that we wouldn't end up cutting any heads or faces in half. The sound recording for this project was a really interesting challenge and also a little bit daunting. We had to come up with something that had a very small profile that was discreet that was easy to move between setups. And so we ended up using a Holophone H2 Pro, 7.1 microphone shaped like a rugby ball. And it basically does exactly what your human head does, but with eight microphone capsules and a 360 degree sphere. I think it's a fantastic opportunity to actually get on stage so anyone can just dial up this imagery and go, I can sit next to the timps or next to the trumpet or next to the harp. And that's just one more way to share our music making experience. So I think it's fabulous. I think the whole project was a great success and it was fantastic for me to be able to see the orchestra in a new way and in a contemporary way as well. So that uh, was a really cool project and um, what was really cool about it was not only the project itself but uh, the PR opportunities that came with it. Um, as virtual reality is really new, uh, there's a lot of opportunity to show people um, that you're an innovative organization uh, through experimenting with this new form of storytelling. And for the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra, they wanted to appeal to a younger 
audience and show people that they weren't, you know, this prehistoric organization uh, and that they were embracing new ways of, of telling stories and, and sharing music and exploring um, what VR could do for them. So what you saw there was a, um, an interactive 360 experience. And so uh, that was on mobile. So you could download the app on Android or iPhone. And when you, um, you, you know, you could put it into a, a cardboard headset, which is just the basic um, headsets that Google offer that you can either buy for like $13 or just download the um, outlines of them and cut them out of cardboard. You know, it's very accessible. So you put your phone into, into some basic headset uh, and then it uses what's called, um, uh, what is it, gaze um, activation. So it has a little circle in the middle and as you look at something, a little circle loads and then it activates whatever you want it to activate. So in this case, we had teleportation. So above the different parts of the orchestra, we had a little icon. If you looked at that icon for long enough, uh, it would pull you over to that location. And that's how we moved around uh, the orchestra. And what was really cool is the different sounds that happened in the orchestra, having that 360 sound meant that when you're up with the conductor, it sounded completely different to being back with the timpani uh, or out in the, you know, where the crowd sits. Um, so it really gives you an appreciation of what it's like to be in the orchestra and really immerses you into that whole experience. So, yeah, that was a really cool thing to make. And you can download that yourself if you want. Just type in uh, NZSO into the App Store and you'll find that app. Uh, and it's free. So the next one is for Mercedes. And I'll just play this video because, again, it's better than me talking, I bet. Welcome to Central Otago. I hope you're wearing something warm. Behind you is Mercedes-Benz first ever premium ute, the Concept X-Class, a stylish explorer with all the strengths of a classic ute. Want to take a closer look? Point the controller and press the thumb pad to move around. Behind these tyres, the all-wheel drive electronic traction system features a transfer case with reduction gear and two on-demand differential locks that instantly channel power to where you need it most. The powerful drive system and extremely tough ladder frame delivers a towing capacity of up to 3.5 tonnes. You can hitch your boat onto here with full confidence and hopefully... All right, I'm going to stop that there because you probably don't want to buy a ute today. But um, what's cool about that is uh, this idea of reality in the virtual, which is that not all virtual experiences have to be, uh, you know, other worlds or have to be completely fantastical. You can create um, situations that are normally inaccessible for customers or um, audiences and just recreate them and give them to people in a virtual way. So, I mean, this one was a great example in that the ute wasn't built yet, so what better way to start selling it than to have a virtual version of it. And uh, we have a big um, event in New Zealand called Field Days, which is uh, where thousands and thousands of farmers from around the country come together and look at the latest, um, you know, farm agriculture technology. And so we had that uh, at the event there and people could come and put on a headset and um, experience uh, this, this cool little activation that we had there. Uh, and that was really successful. And um, it really gave people an insight into what the Ute's actually gonna be like. Um, and yeah, we got, I mean, I'm not sure what the exact sales figures were from that, but, um, but it was a very successful experience and, uh, we have people lining up to to try it because of the, I guess, again, we're in a period where virtual reality is still um, innovative and interesting and making something in virtual reality in and of itself um, draws attention. So it doesn't always have to be um, ridiculous and, and, and out there. Uh, this is an example of how we took that um, ute and we then put it into an augmented experience. So this is in our studio in Wellington, um, and then we've just done a little, um, just popped that same ute there in, in grey this time. Uh, and 
this is someone you know from the point of view of their um, of their iPhone, and you can move around and and look into the unit and that sort of thing. So again, this is a great example of how you can take um, the assets that you're creating in this virtual world and then and then just put them into the real world. And you can imagine, you know, for a car salesman, if they had the whole fleet of cars in their pocket, uh, they're no longer limited to the car yard sort of thing. So it's quite cool what this technology is going to do for that sort of thing. This is um, taking that concept uh, and sort of putting together that virtual world, but in the real world. So this is again filmed through someone's phone and they've created this effectively portal into another world. And then my favorite part is when you see back into the real world. And so if you think about, I mean, at the moment, this is obviously all through um, a mobile screen. And so you're not fully immersed in this experience. You still, still can see your real world around you. But you can imagine that in the future when augmented reality is in uh, everyday glasses, that your world will completely disappear around you. And all of a sudden you're in this virtual world um, but you step through from the real world. So it's quite um, interesting uh, the sort of experiences that will be able to be created, um, especially when you combine that with technology like um, really advanced geolocation and um, close proximity mapping and stuff like that, where you know you look down that alleyway behind you, you could map that out and create a virtual world that was in sync with that so that you could effectively sprint down that street and not run into a wall because your world uh, has, you know, those buildings might turn into the size of a cliff or something like that. But um, yeah, that's going to be quite interesting when, when effectively our two worlds collide the, collide the virtual world and the real world. Which brings me to my point in terms of worlds on top of world, uh, on top of the world. So that's, What's really exciting about augmented reality is that it brings about the opportunity to amplify the world that we've got around us. It doesn't have to completely take away um, what we've got, but it can, you know, create these really cool um, experiences. I, I imagine, uh, and I'll talk about it in, um, coming up, but, you know, think about a brand like Nike. They might make an augmented um, running app where you're running along down the street and they've got all these cool uh, checkpoints or obstacles around the, the city and then next to you as you're running with you is a famous sports star you know you're a famous sports star and they're encouraging you to keep running uh, and um, you know it's it's gamified your whole experience sort of thing uh, another one is like replacing advertising everywhere with uh, beautiful greenery or art or something like that so doesn't always have to be um, negative or you know commercial. It can be artistic as well. So this is an example of um, the company Magic Leap, uh, one of their demos that they made with Star Wars. And you'll notice when I play it, um, just in a little bit. So this is about two years old, so the technology has come a long way, but they're very secretive, so they haven't released much more. But you'll see how the table in front uh, of them is actually um, being, it's not being projected over on top of the, the Their digital assets are, you know, they're sitting on top of the table, they're um, disappearing behind it. So obviously all of the depth is being tracked uh, and taken account of and it feels as though they're they're there in the room um magic leap actually have a test that they put people in the um into the headsets and then they put them in a room and they get them to tell them what's real and what's fake and people always get it wrong they can't tell what's what which is quite crazy um and this is the idea of you know the merging of worlds and and um kind of what i was saying before in terms of but even more advanced where not only are you simply having stuff projected over the world, but you're having, you know, um, characters and, and that sort of thing integrate into the environment around you and interact with the environment around you, which will be quite crazy in terms of, you know, you might see somebody 
running down the street screaming their head off because they're playing some sort of game and they're getting chased by a fake zombie or something. So that's going to be quite weird. But that's the future. Um, so why? Why should people uh, get into virtual reality or care about virtual reality? Well, the big one that everybody talks about is empathy. Um, the way I sort of see it is that when you watch uh, a 2D experience, say like a movie, it can be really emotional and, you know, you can really um, feel like you can relate to the characters or that sort of thing. But you're still being forced to, um, to relate to them. You're still being forced to compare yourself with the experience that those characters are having. Within virtual reality, you are the character. You are in the experience. It is happening to you. And therefore, there's no distance between the emotion. The emotion is just pure and it's only yours. And there's something really powerful about that. Um, and because it's the future of communication. I mean, if you think about uh, what I was just talking about in terms of apps like, uh, you know, Nike having um, having a running app and that sort of thing, well, um, it's going to go well beyond that in terms of commercial uses. Uh, I think in construction, it's going to be insane uh, in terms of, you know, before you build a building, it's completely 3D rendered on the build site. And then as you build, it's almost like a um, fill in the blanks type thing where, you know, the, the builders will be able to see every single um, aspect of the build process live in front of them. And they'll just be able to follow those as effectively 3D instructions. Um, and then once the building's built, if any maintenance needs to be done, they'll be able to look at a wall and all of a sudden they'll be able to see through the wall and see all the pipework and everything like that. So um, that's just one small example. Um, but yeah, the way in which we um, interact will change dramatically, especially once the uh, headsets become mainstream. I mean, we'll effectively lose our mobile phones because everything's going to be projected around us. Um, so there's no, there's definitely no stopping this technology. It's going to happen again. Magic Leap has had $2 billion invested in it. And that's just one company who don't even have a product yet. Um, you know, there's companies like Microsoft and, and Facebook uh, are betting on this technology being the future. So um, you kind of have to pay some attention. And even though it seems scary, I'm sure people thought cell phones were scary back in the day. So, you know, you just got to embrace it, really. It's what I'm trying to say. Um, so these are some of my fun predictions in terms of, of what will happen with the industry. Um, Apple will sell digital real estate. What I mean by this is that it might not be Apple, but it might be Google. They might all do it. But effectively, if you've got, um, if you want to augment uh, experiences all around the place, there will be some um, leading, kind of like you have iOS or Android. Uh, within there, there'll be um, like AR worlds effectively. So, you know, you'll be able to just uh, open up your camera and then anywhere you point it, uh, within on your iPhone, there'll be augmented experiences. But say Apple did that, they couldn't just make it open source and allow anybody to put anything anywhere because all of a sudden, you know, some kid would put zombies everywhere and it would just get really messy. So they'll start selling um, geolocated uh, digital real estate. So say we want to create an experience uh, at our studio in Wellington, we'll have to buy um, that area so that when somebody uses their app, and walks past our studio and, and looks at it, then they'll see this um, augmented experiences that we've created there. Uh, and so, yeah, that just that's a whole new industry in and of itself, uh, out of nowhere. Um, brands will create worlds. It's, again, the same idea as what I was talking about with, say, Nike, um, but other brands will do it as well, where, um, you know, you're walking around and, and you want to see the world through the eyes of Adidas or you want to see it through the eyes of Tesla or something like that. And all of a sudden they get to give you their interpretation of what they think the world should be and they can gamify it and they can make it more beautiful or they can make it uglier or, um, you know, whatever they want to do. And so that's a pretty interesting, um, again, commercial application for uh, AR. 
um, training will all be virtual. If you think about, um, you know, military training, that's pretty obvious. That's dangerous. So why not do that virtually? But then you think of stuff more practical, like um, training for uh, lines managers, you know, like power lines, people who are changing um, power lines. Why put them in harm's way when you could actually put them into an experience to do the same thing? or you know firefighting or police or even uber is actually using virtual reality to prime their drivers into what it's like to be in a situation when you've got a hostile passenger so by putting them into these situations in virtual reality it leaves them with a lasting impression that is a lot more real than if they had say just watched a video or read an article about it um actors will be in your house that with best explained by um, this image here. So this is with a company called Eight-Eye who turn humans into holograms. Uh, they have a whole bunch of cameras in 360 degrees and it restitches your, uh, you back together as a hologram, which you can then uh, either project into a virtual world or into your house. And so, um, you know, if you think about, you wanna learn some stretches and you can learn them with Will Smith or you want to you know learn uh, how to swing a golf club and you get to do that with Tiger Woods or whoever's now the most popular golfer because I'm terrible at sports so um, you get the point so how how can you get into it well the first thing you do is need to do is find a purpose because uh, like all new exciting technologies um, you can quite easily uh, go down a rabbit hole or spending a bunch of money on something that doesn't actually fulfill a purpose at all. So not every story needs to be told in virtual reality. So make sure you've got a good reason first and foremost to tell your story in a virtual world or to put people into a situation that they couldn't normally be in or give them an experience that they can't normally have. That's got to be first and foremost. If you do have a purpose though, and you do have a, a good reason to put someone into a virtual world, then um, then the cool thing is, is that nothing has really been worked out yet. It's still such an such early days in the industry where, um, you know, filmmakers haven't got it worked out, gamers haven't got it worked out. It's, 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 we're, we're establishing the rules at the moment. So it's anybody's game. And so that's, for me, that's a really exciting opportunity that, um, we just get to really explore this whole new world and um, yeah, you just get to have a lot of fun and, and play around with it. So my five tips, if you do want to get into VR or AR, um, number one, as I just said, is the purpose. Is VR or AR right? And this even applies to the type of um, technology that you use within this um within VR so it might be that you know you don't need to make a fully interactive experience in a fully virtual reality experience you could just make a 360 video um, tourism is a great example you don't need to uh, take people to uh, a new place and then have them interact with it by simply taking them there um, and showing them it that can be enough and then they actually get to go to the place and experience it in real life and that's obviously how you make the real money so there's a there's a purpose between the different types of technology as well um, then I would say start small um, because it's all new and because it's so unknown uh, you you can't bet on anybody being an expert in this space and the best way to um, mitigate your risk is by just doing it iteratively starting off small and then building on that um, and the great thing about all of this stuff being relatively digital is that there's the opportunity to do that. You can always update your app or you can always update the experience uh, and then just push that out to your users. So um, yeah, you don't have to go all out from the beginning. Um, third thing I'd say is work with storytellers. It's all well and good creating a whiz bang experience, but if it hasn't got a story in there and if there's no um, emotional connection from the, uh, from the experience to the viewer, then they'll forget about it in a week. It might be really fun at the time, but it needs to have something that will last with them that, that allows them to remember it and feel it. Um, 
The fourth one is stick close to reality. I would say that at this point in time with where virtual and augmented reality is uh, in the marketplace and with consumers, just making a virtual experience in and of itself is interesting and engaging and captivating. You don't have to create this entire new mind-blowing world because in actual fact, it's quite disconcerting for people and it's almost it becomes so far removed from what we understand and what we know in reality that you lose any connection to it or any um, ability to uh, compare that to your real life. So I think staying relatively close to the real world and then putting a bit of a twist on it again, like putting people somewhere they couldn't normally go or doing something they couldn't normally do is what makes it the most powerful. Um, And then the fifth one is just imagine and, the cool thing about this is that you're literally, it's limitless in terms of what you're doing. You know, if you do want to build an entire new world, you could do that. And I definitely know there are people who are looking at doing that. Um, the guy who started Second Life uh, is trying to create a, a virtual Second Life, effectively, which is a, a world which is open source and people can build um, whatever they want to build in it and um, do whatever they want to do in it and that's just going to change the way that um, I guess people uh, are entertained and engage with each other. And yeah, all you have to really do is watch the movie coming out. uh, I think maybe in two months time called ready player one by Steven Spielberg, which paints it in a pretty dystopian light, but it's kind of, um, yeah, it will, it will show you what uh, what's possible with virtual reality. So that is my talk. Hopefully, this is my first webinar, so um, I'm not too good at it, but hopefully you got some out, something out of that and it wasn't just me rambling in a real monotone voice. Um, and yeah, I'm going to do some questions now. If I can learn how do I exit this main screen thing. So if you have any questions, you can now type it in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. Okay. Uh, So Ben, we have a question here. Okay. Okay, the question is that uh, what kind of costs are we talking about compared to normal uh, videos that we have been doing till now yeah that's um that's a really good question and it's really hard to say because obviously every experience is bespoke and custom um but i guess you you can think about 360 video as um the closest thing to traditional filmmaking and so that's using you know cameras that um you can get off the shelf and um, relatively well-known um, editing techniques that are similar to, to traditional filmmaking or video production. So you're looking at um, around, I would say, $25,000 NZ, which is about, I don't know what that is, US, maybe like 18000 US, as a starting point for, say, a, a two- or three-minute video. Um, again, all of those costs are varying on locations, talent, all that sort of thing, but... For the simple filming and, and editing process, yeah, we would start at about 25000 Going up from there, um, creating more interactive virtual reality experiences, the fully interactive volumetric experiences, they start to get more expensive and you're looking at about $50,000 um, plus. Um, and yeah, I mean, again, it's limitless, so you could just spend millions and millions. But um, yeah, I would say if you want to... I wouldn't invest more than say a hundred, a hundred and fifty thousand dollars on your first VR project because you need to test the waters anyway and, and see if it's right for you. Okay, thank I hope you. that helps. It's very again, it's very, it's so vague because it's it's so experimental and everything is so new and every experience is going to be so different. But in our experience here, we're we're dealing with clients looking at at those sort of sorts of budgets from about 25,000 to 150. Okay. Uh, 
uh, Ben, we have a couple of questions in Q&A. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'll start with the first one. Hello from Hong Kong. Thanks for session. Supposing we know what our purpose is and want to start small, what would be a lo logical first step? Whom do you even ask for help with this kind of thing? Do I ask my local video shop? Good question. Uh, it's the people who have gotten into VR are, are so diverse. You've got um, coders who might have worked in, you know, IT or tech. You've got filmmakers. You've got gamers. You've got um, theatre professionals. You've got uh, people who have just come from completely left field organisations, seen the opportunity, and started a VR company. And it, it is quite hard to know who's actually doing you know, doing it right and, and is legitimate. I mean, obviously I'm going to be biased and say you need to talk to us because um, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't say that. But um, you want to find people who understand that the story element and connecting with people emotionally is the most important part because creating a great experience is only worthwhile if it has an objective and actually... Um, reach as a goal that you have as a business. So for Wrestler, our ethos in creating virtual reality content is to create experiences which impact people in the real world because impacting people just in the virtual world for us is not, um, it's not good enough. Um, and it's also, um, it doesn't really align with our values in terms of what, how we want to see humanity progressing. So that's quite a, a um, uh, a, elaborate answer to your question, but I would say you yeah, try and find people who really understand the storytelling aspect of virtual reality. Um, and I mean, the best thing to do is find people who have created an experience before and have a track record. And that can be hard because there's not many people out there who have done stuff. But um, there's a lot of there's a lot of people claiming they can do the stuff who can't. Okay, second question. How effective is Samsung 360-degree VR camera for content development? Also, please advise how big will be the content files for a two-minute VR, VR project. Um, I would say the Samsung camera is good for, um, for like what we call on the industry pre -vis. So it's sort of like testing out what your shot's going to look like. Um, for the real deal. I wouldn't make a commercial project with it um, because I think that uh, brands need to have higher quality content than uh, consumer um, level content. And so, yeah, if you are a consumer and you want to make a little video then, or an influencer say, then I think those cameras would be right. But I think if you want to make something, if you're a large brand and you need to, you know, um, project uh, or have something that aligns with your brand values, then um, I probably wouldn't use that level of camera. Uh, content files for a two-minute video, again, hard to say. Depends on what your output is. Are you outputting it as 4K, which only those cameras can do, or are you outputting it at 8K? Um, it's not too dissimilar to, um, if you're talking 360 video, not too dissimilar to standard um, video size. So you're looking at like 500 megabytes to a gig main, maybe. Um, again, it's all about how, you know, the, the level of quality. The thing you also need to realize is that the headsets only play a certain level of quality at this point in time as well. So um, you can't actually, you can output it, you know, as, as high bit rate as you want, but then the headsets will only play it back um, at whatever they can do. Uh, or your mobile phone, you know, in terms of the, that max resolution. Um, so yeah, it's it's um, it's pretty similar to conventional video in that way. How do people use VR at home? Uh, phone app. So I probably should have explained it a little bit more when I was going through the um, the different types of VR. But in terms of the technology that allows the different types of VR with 360, you can just use that on um, on any mobile device uh, and you can put it into, you know, as I was saying, a cardboard headset or whatever. Um, and Or you don't have to at all. You can just hold your phone in front of you and turn your, um, the camera around. And it won't be as immersive, but you'll still get the idea effectively. Virtual reality, the, the actual uh, immersive interactive stuff, 
you have to have a specialized headset for that. So we're talking like an Oculus Rift or an HTC Vive. And that's where the barrier to entry gets quite high because of cost. So, you know, for the Vive headset, you're looking at $1,000 for the headset. But not only that, you need a PC that is powerful enough to be able to play the content on it. And that's going to set you back two to three grand. So, you know, that's, you're looking at around three to $4,000 NZ just to start doing the um, experiential stuff. So that's where the um, activation-based content is really powerful because if you can bring your audience to you rather than your content to your audience, then um, it makes the, I guess, their barrier to entry lower. Hope that answers your question. Okay, thanks, Ben. Uh, ben, uh, there's another question. Uh, this is uh, about the technology. You know, since the it's still early days, you feel that uh, the technology might change drastically in coming years and uh, the cost might come down? Yeah, so, well, in terms of the creation cost, that's not going to come down a huge amount immediately because all the cost at the moment is related to effectively manpower you know it's literally coders sitting on a computer and creating digital worlds or in the case of 360 video it's still cameramen out there with a camera filming stuff and so that's all time-based and that's not going to change a huge amount what's going to change is the barrier to entry for the consumer um, and the uh, cost of advanced headsets so companies like HTC uh, who created the Vive, which is the most advanced virtual reality headset, they've already announced um, a new headset this year, which is twice or maybe even three times the resolution of the last one, uh, is wireless, it is um, lighter, it's, it's just, you know, like way, way better um, in terms of uh, technological advancement. And they haven't announced the price yet, but what we'll see is, the price dropping for those headsets as well. And not only that, but um, the computing power will get, um, will become more accessible as well. And, you know, computers will get faster and faster and the cost of them will come down. And if you're familiar with Moore's law, um, the, the rate of improvement will be exponential. Um, and yeah, the costs will, will drop over time. Um, but we're not going to see mass, um, I guess, mass saturation in a consumer market for another at least three years. Uh, and then when it comes to the augmented reality, like the, the glasses I was talking about from Magic Leap, you're looking at five to 10 years for that. Um, but again, it's crazy when you think about that, you know, the iPhone's only been around for 10 years and what that's done to society. Um, this will be a lot faster. Okay. Okay, so uh, Ben, there's another question which says, what sort of timeline would we be looking at to produce a 360 degree video? Uh, is there an optimal length? Um, it's what sort of timeline would it be looking at? So I'm not sure if that question means how long should a 360 video be or how long does it take to make? So I'll, I'll just answer both. Um, it depends on who's making it in terms of how long it will take to make. Um, a company like ours would look to turn around a 360 video in probably two to three months. Um, the reason for that, that's quite slow for us um, compared to the video content we create. Um, the reason for that is just because of the stitching that um, you have to do with each shot and that can take quite a while. And also the storytelling element of it um, because it's so new, we, we do want to spend a bit of time working out what that story is going to be and almost um, not doing a whole bunch of previs and shooting it, but um, playing it out and seeing what it's going to be like as a whole experience um, because you can't really just go out and film a whole bunch of stuff and play around with it in the edit suite like you can with conventional video. So it takes a bit longer to make. Um, and then in terms of how long the experience should be, that is um, dependent on uh, what your consumers or your audience, um, how they're going to um, interact with the experience. So the All Birds one, for example, that was a retail experience that people would play whilst sitting in a shop 
whilst their friend is pairing, trying on a pair of shoes, you know? So we made that two minutes long because we didn't want people, you know, sitting in there and then thinking, oh, maybe my friend has actually left the store by now. So it had to be short and sharp and, and to the point. Um, if, you've, if you're creating an experience for people who are at home and, and they want to be immersed in a completely new world, then you're looking at um, eight to 10 minutes. 10 minutes, I would say, would be the max at this point because um, the headsets can get a little uncomfortable after time. You do get a little bit disorientated and um, it's amazing how much longer time feels whilst you're in a headset than what it is in reality. So, yeah, because it's it's all new to everyone, you don't want to sort of um, make it too exhausting. It's it's a lot to take in. So, yeah, I'd say max 10 minutes for a brand experience, two to three. Okay. Uh, thanks, Ben. Uh, I think we have one person by the name of Jen Wu who has raised... Uh, her hand or her, his hand, if the person can write a question. Jen, would you be able to write your point in the Q&A or chat box? Okay, we'll wait for a minute, Ben, to see if we have a question from pop up from Jen. Cool. Okay. And uh, the, for the rest of you, you can always, I believe, send questions if you have any to us and we'll forward it to Ben and I'm sure we'll be able to come back to you with the answer. So yeah, think, or you can just um, email me direct at ben at wrestler.nz. Yes. So uh, I think we can end this. There's no question from Jen now. And, cool. Uh, oh, here's one. Thank, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Haptic gloves, like in Ready Player One, a reality yet. Yeah, haptic gloves are a reality. There's a lot of haptic hardware available, um, but it's just clunky and not very cool, if that makes sense. So you could go out and, and you know buy the stuff, but you're going to look pretty ridiculous. Um, and the amount of experiences that there are to actually use this technology are really limited because it's not mainstream technology yet so um like the dance experience we're creating that uses not haptic gloves but um it uses body tracking so we put a sensor on your waist and then on your feet and on your hands and so it tracks your entire body um, so that's kind of similar um but yeah there's like haptic vests where you know if you are playing a first person shooter and you get shot in the chest, you feel it vibrate in the chest and stuff like that. So it's quite cool. Um, there's an experience called the void, which you can do. And um, I did it in New York in Madame Two Swords of all places. And it was a Ghostbusters experience where you put on a headset and then they mapped a physical world with a digital world and, but obviously made it Ghostbusters themed and all crazy and there's ghosts flying at you and you have to shoot them out of the sky and stuff and you're running around. And in that we wore a haptic vest. And when a ghost, there was one point where a ghost flew through you and it sort of vibrated the whole chest and it felt really kind of eerie and, and bizarre um, because of that haptic sensation. So yeah, it's there, but it's just not very mainstream yet. Okay, I think we, we will need to wrap up now. Uh, thank you, Ben, for the fabulous presentation. I have loads of, loads of learning here. This space really looks very exciting. I'm sure right. all of you have some takeaways. And a quick reminder, we'll be sending you, all of you, a recording of this presentation. And we will also be sending a, a quick survey link. So if you could let us know how we are doing in the content-wise and if any of the topics need to be covered in the upcoming webinars. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Ben. Cool. Not a problem. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye.